Good morning and welcome to City Hall. We'll get started with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Father James Pruitt is with St. James Catholic Church, a fast-growing parish in the south side of Oklahoma City. He'll lead us in the invocation. Afterwards, I'll ask Councilman Pat Ryan if he'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would everyone please stand? Let us pray. Father, we gather always with grateful hearts, mindful of your love for your people, and especially your love for Oklahoma. We thank you for this place of Oklahoma City here on the Oklahoma River. You filled us with resources beyond our imagination. You've given us creative people to learn to use what you've given. Help us to build up a city where all can find a home, where justice is fair for all, where we people can walk always as your people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Each month, the South Oklahoma City Kiwanis Club helps us honor one of our employees as the employee of the month, and I'll ask Bart Schott to come forward. Bart comes to us uh, as an IT person in our personnel department, and getting to know Bart a little bit this morning, I learned that uh, he's one of those many thousands of people that we get into our community uh, as a retired Air Force person. So he was a meteorologist at Tinker Air Force Base, and now is, is directing the IT part of our personnel department. We have a resolution, I'll ask the clerk to read it. Whereas Bart Schott has been a city employee for 12 years and is a human resources information specialist in the operations division of the personnel department. Whereas Bart, with his knowledge of HRIS policies and procedures, is always willing to answer questions or give guidance when needed and is always working to improve and make it easier for employees to complete personnel paperwork. Whereas Bard has been updating and redefining various standard personnel forms and in the process developed interactive smart forms that are more efficient and eliminate the need to re-enter repetitive data on the most used and required forms. Whereas Bard, in addition to making it easier to edit documents and maintain specific information for future use, also made it possible to electronically transfer documents for signature approval resulting in paperwork being handled more efficiently and more timely. Whereas Bart's suggestion of using three or four ply carbonless paper to reduce the need to print copies for record keeping was cost effective for many departments and conformed with the city's sustainability efforts by producing less waste. Whereas Bart developed personnel procedures that are helpful to employees responsible for personnel paperwork and made the information and forms accessible on inside OKC SharePoint site. Whereas this council desires to recognize Bart Schott for his dedication, professionalism, commitment, and contributions that assist all departments and employees of the City of Oklahoma City. Now therefore be it resolved by the Mayor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City that they do hereby thank and commend Bart Shop, March 2013, South Oklahoma City Kiwanis Club Employee of the Month. And the suspense does not end there, Bart, because we have to vote on this. Make sure it's official. How about a motion? And a second. Cast your votes. Now let's show our appreciation to our Employee of the Month, Bart. Congratulations. Thanks very much for your service to your country and to Oklahoma City.
point out item 3B of the council agenda. We'll have a presentation from Roy Williams. Roy is the president of the Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce and comes by quarterly to update the council on uh, things that are happening down at the chamber offices. Good morning, Roy. Good morning, Mayor. Mayor, members of council, Mr. City Manager, thank you again for the opportunity to visit with you uh, very briefly. Uh, there are um, kind of four areas I want to briefly touch on. Uh, certainly would entertain any questions you might have. Um, at the conclusion of that. Uh, starting out, um, I wanted to say a couple things related to Tinker. Um, obviously, Tinker is our largest center of employment, and as a result, that is a very high priority, if not the top priority of the chamber. And we're working very closely with our congressional delegation on a variety of issues, most of which you're quite aware of. Uh, sequestration being really at the top of that list, that's a significant concern for us. Uh, if you're not aware of it, there's in excess of 42,000 federal government jobs in our 10-county region in central Oklahoma that have about a $3.6 billion annual payroll. And if you do the math, that means about 1 in 20 jobs uh, in central Oklahoma are federal government jobs. And within this region, there's a high concentration of these jobs in Oklahoma County. And in fact, our concentration of federal civilian jobs is twice what you would find nationally. So sequestration is going to have a stronger and more direct impact on us than what most other metro markets uh, would experience because of uh, this high uh, concentration. Uh, there are estimates that we've received from the Air Force that about 15,000 employees would be potentially exposed to furloughs. And we're also expecting furloughs at the Federal Aviation Administration and other non-defense agencies. We also expect hiring freezes, deferred maintenance, and an impact on contract and temporary employment. Um, I don't know that you could call this good timing, but tomorrow uh, we take a relatively large delegation, chamber delegation, to uh, D.C., which is our annual fly-in. And we're meeting with all of our congressional delegation as well as both of our U.S. Senators. And this is certainly a topic uh, that we're going to explore. And part of that visit also includes a meeting with uh, Secretary Michael Donnelly, who is the Secretary of the Air Force. Uh, so not only Secretary Donnelly, but other officials at the Pentagon uh, will also be in attendance at a reception we're going to be having. So we'll be having conversations with them and hopefully get some insight into uh, any progress that is being made on sequestration. Uh, we're also looking forward uh, within the next couple weeks to hosting the Air Force Sustainment Center Community Leaders Program. Uh, that will be in March, and that's going to bring community leaders uh, from Robbins, from Hill, and Tinker to discuss issues that are impacting uh, sustainment of Air Force weapon systems. So that is something we've been involved in for a number of years. And finally, I want to mention that Tinker Dining Out uh, is on May 5th this year. Uh, this will be the 40th anniversary of the Dining Out. Uh, and that brings Tinker and community leadership together. Many of you have been to that event, and I'd encourage <clears throat> each of you to consider attending. It uh, shows how much we appreciate what goes on with the Air Force here. Second area I wanted to touch on was an economic forecast. <clears throat> we just completed our annual economic forecast, and we expect Oklahoma City to continue adding employment through, to, to, through 2013. We anticipate a growth of somewhere around 2.5%. <clears throat> Weekly earnings growth in 2012 was more than 10% over the prior year, which was pretty much at the top of the list of metro areas across the country. Uh, we believe, though, that a more modest baseline forecast of about 3.4% is expected this year and picking up to about 5.2% next year. Our, po our population continu continues to grow very healthily. Uh, we're, we're now at the level of about 2,000 new people moving into uh, our metro every month. Um, concurrent with that, economic development activity too is also picking up and uh, in, con in, in concurrence with that, the time frame of decision making is shrinking. So things are moving very quickly. We're also seeing a higher quality of prospects right now. Um, but due to what's going on nationally, we still see decisions being delayed. The problem with that is when they delay a decision, then when they make it, they want it yesterday. Uh, so they want immediate access, immediate accessibility to sites, buildings, and land. <clears throat> so that kind of puts us in a position, since we've had such a successful economy here, that we lack a lot of available economic development product. 
Other cities who have not been so lucky have plentiful buildings, warehouses, facilities, vacant land, uh, and we kind of have none of those. Uh, ours has all been occupied, so we struggle every day trying to find available sites, available buildings uh, that can be utilized immediately. Uh, it, hardly not a day goes by that we don't hear from a commercial broker uh, that they're dealing with a client that they cannot find a piece of property for or cannot find a building for. So we're losing a lot of good employment opportunities due to that. <clears throat> As you know, the employment land study completed by the city uh, with some help from us identified a lot of these challenges <clears throat> and, and we certainly can't let these go unaddressed. Uh, as, as all of you know, the east side of the airport development are really a great start, but we can't put all of our eggs in one basket. We can't just say that alone is going to meet our community needs. So the other downside of that is it's only a lease option. It's not a purchase option. So it certainly is a good product to have in the marketplace, but it's not a solution to what all we have. <clears throat> so we have to find other opportunities. And historically in this community, those have been the result of public-private partnerships. That's how we've been able to put together large tracts of land, large available buildings, et cetera. So we're going to continue to pursue that and, and want to work very closely with the city in, in trying to identify new opportunities in the marketplace. <clears throat> Excuse me, a third area I wanted to touch on uh, were trade shows. We're kind of at the beginning uh, of this succession of trade shows that we go to to market Oklahoma City in key industries and in key business segments. Uh, the first up is South by Southwest in Austin. Uh, we partner with state and local partners on this event, promoting our interactive industry, our film industry, our creative services industries. Uh, immediately after that, uh, we will have a very large delegation, nearly 100 people, the largest we've ever had, going to the Biotechnology Industry Organization's annual meeting in Chicago. Uh, and this event brings uh, unbelievable partnering opportunities for growing companies. And in fact, we're now seeing it turn into a deal-making activity. We actually have companies getting financing commitments, getting signed contracts, getting partners at uh, BIO. Uh, right on the heels of that, uh, we go to RECON, the International Council of Shopping Centers in Las Vegas. Uh, this is a show that is packed with appointments, uh, and we'll be doing that uh, with a pretty good-sized delegation from Oklahoma City, um, calling on major national destination retailers and other developers who are in the retail business. The final thing is kind of a miscellaneous, uh, and I just want to mention a couple random things. Uh, one is uh, inner city visits and the attention we continue to receive from other communities. Uh, just in the last couple months, we've hosted groups from Louisiana, Kansas, Texas, and we have others uh, that, are, that are getting ready to come here. And not only is it inbound, it's also outbound. A number of us, and Jim and I were talking about this not too long ago, are asked frequently to go to other communities and do presentations, and I've recently been to Milwaukee, South Carolina, and I'm going to Marquette University for a session in a couple weeks. Obviously, as you know, the U.S. Conference of Mayors probably sparked a whole lot of this when we had it in 2010, and because that's when we started seeing the wave of, of cities coming here. Well, we have another opportunity that's going to hit us that probably will cause a second wave, and that's we're hosting the American Chamber of Commerce Executives annual meeting in July here. So my peers from all across North America and, in fact, across the world, nearly a 1,000 of them are going to be here in July, and, and one of the major presentations has to do with what we did for the Mayor's Conference, and that is all about maps. So we anticipate a second wave of inner city visits after that. Um, Last thing, uh, we hosted a Friday forum uh, recently talking about the development of Oklahoma City as a visitor delegation, and uh, we had four phenomenal panelists. Chuck Schroeder was one, Glenn Mary with U.S. Rowing, uh, Lance McDaniel with Dead Center, and Sherry Scarborough, a travel writer and a blogger. And it was an extremely interesting discussion about where Oklahoma City is and where Oklahoma City is going. It's uh, the event is posted on our website, so if you'd like to see that really entertaining discussion, just go to okcchamber.com under event videos. So I'd encourage you to see it. With that, I'll conclude, Mayor, and answer any questions if anybody has any. Any questions? Yeah, David. Roy, on the uh, issue of, of available land or, or uh, structures, I would just say from my personal opinion, I think we need to possibly look at uh, – areas that are currently underutilized and look at areas, say, south of the river 
depending upon what location we're talking about, as far south as 15th to 25th Street, there just may be areas that could be better served, especially if it was a facility like the Dell Call Center. Right. I think that's uh, a very, that type of, of uh, development uh, works well with being right next to residential as well as other business related areas. But if we go further east, especially east of Shields Boulevard, you know, there's just been some very old industrial right. areas that might, could be better utilized. Uh, and then east of I-35, maybe even the southern portion of Trosper Park that is somewhat underutilized could be uh, looked upon, especially given its proximity to I-35. Yeah. So I just think there is space and opportunities especially depend upon the right type of company wanting to relocate. Right. The key is, is getting them ready. I mean, you, you mentioned Dell, because when Dell came here, that wasn't ready. <laughs> that, that was a landfill. So it took a long time uh, and a lot of effort to get that site ready. And fortunately, Dell was a company that was willing to wait. Today, they're not willing to wait. Uh, you know, they want to take ownership or move in 30, 60, 90 days. Uh, and, and what happens is they'll go to the city that has that. I see. Uh, and that's what we're losing now. They'll get down to three, four, five cities. And if the city that they would really like to be in doesn't have facilities, they go to the one that does uh, because of their timelines on product delivery or service delivery. Uh, so it's frustrating to be at that. I mean, it's a, it's good that we're in that position, but it's bad that we're in that position. Yeah. Well, are we in the position as it relates to the land, or is it just the, the capital infrastructure already being there? I mean, the it, it's, it's all of it. Uh, I had a broker yesterday in my office said he couldn't find 20 acres of land for an industrial project in the metro. Uh, and what he meant by that was it didn't have existing infrastructure to it, so it didn't have the necessary utilities on site, water, sewer, telecommunications, that kind of uh, highway or road access. Um, and I mean, every week, you know, we have people looking 50 to 100,000 uh, square foot, either warehouse or manufacturing facilities. We have none, none in our marketplace. Everything is full. Yeah. Uh, Roy, has anybody at the chamber made a, an estimate of what the economic impact of sequestering would be on the city? We, dollars? we have not. We've gotten stuff from the Air Force, and uh, most of it has not been uh, city-related. It's been state-related. In Oklahoma, they indicated something like, I think in the first year, a negative impact of some $127 million. That was a number that I saw, which to me seems very low. And the bulk of that would be in Oklahoma City area because of the concentration? We would be the largest percentage. I mean, obviously, there's five military bases in Oklahoma, but Tinker is by far the largest. And we also have more federal employees, like the Federal Aviation Administration as well. We so, yeah, we would take the brunt of it. When we talk about furloughs, it's, it's, I think, important to understand just one day a week means a 20 percent reduction in salary. Right. And that's 20% of dollars that we don't get spent on items that incur sales tax. It's so the equivalent of 20% layoff. Yeah. So it's important. I think we need to keep that in mind as we go forward. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, David? Well, on a positive note, I, I'd just like to thank you for speaking at the Transit Town Hall meeting a week or so ago. And it was interesting to look at the history or hear about the history of the Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce in the development of transportation throughout the city's history, both public transportation, roads, and highways. So thank you for your yeah, we, comments. For those of you who weren't there, we've been involved in transportation for over 100 years, including a stint in running the airport for a while. <laughs> Any other comments or questions for Roy? Roy, thanks very much for your comments. My pleasure. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate your work of your staff. All right, we're on item four of the council. Agenda, item 4A is to receive the Journal of Council Proceedings for February 26th, and item 4B is to approve the Journal of Council Proceedings for February 19th. Is there a motion on these? Comments or questions on the journal? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. 
Item 5 is request for uncontested continuances. <clears throat> Mayor, on page 7, under item 8A, page 7, 8A, PUD 1476, the applicant has requested that this item be deferred until the April 2nd council meeting. Okay. And moving to the unsecured properties on page 8, under item 8F1A, 2201 North Kate, we ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item B, 3509 South Klein, we ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item C, 2206 West Lindsay, we ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item D, 1704 North Lynn, we ask that that be stricken or rework for additional violations. Item E, 8212 Lyman Road, we ask that that be stricken. The owner demolished, we'll rework that as rebel and debris. And item K, 3024 Southwest 40th, we ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Are there any other requests for uncontested continuances? All right, let's recess the council meeting. Convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority, where there are six items. All right, comments or questions on the MFA? Just a brief question, Your Honor. Um, some of these are workman uh, comp claims or, or issues, and there's been legislation issued, I mean, started the state to, to uh, revise our system. Has the city taken a position on whether that's good or bad for the city? We have not taken an official position on it all on that legislation, although workers' comp reform has been, has been a listed support position for us for a number of years. Okay, but we're not specifically supporting that particular piece of legislation. Um, I, I really, uh, I think we're going to bring that to the legislative committee that, that, comes, that meets in the next week or two, a couple of weeks. In, in view of these actions, then there's just a couple in here, and they happen. Could we get a presentation sometime on the city safety committee? safety program, accident prevention program. Yes. Uh, because it's important that we, you know, have a good, crisp program to educate people as best we can to avoid those accidents. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh -huh. Any other comments on the MFA? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OC MFA, convening the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority, just claims and payroll today. Yeah. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Adjourn the OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, and again, just the claims and payroll. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Adjourn the OCEAT, reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. All right, we have a motion and a second on the consent docket. Are there any individual considerations? Your Honor, uh, C.1 and N, uh, uh, and, and. Okay. And, Mayor, if I could, I just would like to mention uh, 6T, as in Thomas. All right, Pat, you want to get started with item C1? Uh, yes, sir. Just uh, uh, C1 is something we do periodically at, at, the, at the council, and that is to release part of an easement. And I wondered why we release only part of an easement. Is if there's no need for the easement, wouldn't it be easier if we re re release the whole thing? No, typically what, it, what has happened is there's been an encroachment in an easement and they're trying to build something on it. And so it may be a 10 feet easement and we've uh, identified that our utility is on the south side of that easement and, and it won't hurt us by vacating two feet on the north side or something along those lines. That's, that's generally what happens. So. Um, oftentimes there is, is, is some utility in there and we determine that the, the partial release of an easement will not inhibit our ability to, to access that utility. Thank you. Okay. On item uh, 6N, this is an item that uh, has something to do with Crosstown Expressway and we're taking money out of uh, unlisted funds to do this. I wondered why we were doing that. Are, we're doing that? Yeah, why are we doing it? We had a, an agreement with ODOT to uh, pick up certain responsibilities as part of the I-40 relocation. That was part of the... How uh, come it wasn't in, in our geo bond issue as a specific project rather than being out of unlisted streets? Uh, why is it not? Why was it not a specific listed project? Yeah, because as, there's, a, you know, we're taking a million and three out of uh, unlisted streets, which would do a lot of work on city streets that need attention. Right, but we also did have an illicit project to enhance with I-40 and the boulevard as a illicit project too, and, and so it, it goes in association with, with that focus. Okay. So, but we, we, we came up a million dollars short, so we're taking it out of this line. 
Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a million dollars. So we need to, to pay for our obligation for I-40. Thank you. Can I follow up on what Pat's, because my understanding is that we were, we spent a, quite a bit of our unlisted funds prior to this $1.4 million allocation. Can somebody tell us how much unlisted funds we've now spent after this allocation? Eric can. Or, may, or he can, maybe he can, but he will get the information to you. I, I will get that information to you by the end of the meeting, but, but I'll find out what the balance is as of today. But give me just the general sense of where we are without a specific number. You know, when we look at the bond issue as a whole, the 2007 bond issue, um, we're probably about 40 percent complete. We've spent more than 40 percent of the enlisted funds to date. And again, the purpose of the enlisted funds is to make sure that we finish the listed projects, but in some cases we use those funds for new projects that come up before the next bond issue. This falls into that category where additional work came up on I-40, the unlisted was an appropriate use of those funds, and so we're recommending that today to make those payments for the screen walls for Interstate 40. But I'll get you a balance here before the end of the meeting. But are we, we've completed about 40 percent. Have we spent well over 40 percent of the unlisted funds, or we're about even, or? It's more than that, but I need to get the exact number. I just don't have that with me this morning. There's still, there's still significant unlisted fund, uh, unlisted project dollars available yet to be sold. And, okay. and let me give you the assurances that when we, when we budget projects, we don't rely just on the unlisted funds to pay for change orders or overages on the listed projects. We budget those projects to include also project contingency. So only at the case that we use all the project contingency do we even need to use the enlisted funds. In most cases, I would tell you the enlisted funds are for new projects, projects that weren't contemplated or weren't on a list when the bond issue was passed. But we, we've used, for example, unlisted funds. We've done developer matches for projects that weren't on the bond. We have. Of about how much? By project, I mean two of the most recent ones um, on uh, North Rockwell Avenue. It was it was almost a 50-50 match. In that case, I believe there was between four and five hundred thousand dollars spent out of unlisted funds with a four or five hundred thousand dollar match. Um, we've had others that are less than that that are as low as fifteen thousand um, dollars on just smaller projects, smaller rural match projects for developers. And we spent about a million of unlisted funds widening Grand Boulevard. I don't yes. recall. So several, whole, several years ago, yes. Yeah. So near the Whole Foods. Okay, so can you, can you give me a breakdown of exactly how much is left, how much we spent? And I'd be happy to do that, yes. Thank we'll, you. we'll run a report, but yeah, we can do that. Thank you. All right, Skip? Mayor, I, I always wanted to ask a question on 6AL. Okay, I think Meg's up next. Okay. Um, yeah. Meg, you want to talk about item T? Yes, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to uh, point this out as another, you know, significant milestone in our uh, efforts to get our MAPS 3 work underway. This is uh, phase one of um, and the second project out at the fairgrounds. Parking lot improvements uh, that have been designed um, and actually uh, estimated construction cost is under budget in one of these. One of the first times I've seen that, so I'm excited to get started. We're going to be grading the uh, old side of the racetrack and uh, leveling that space. It'll be used for the midway uh, for next year's uh, state fair. So we've got a lot of really important things happening out at the fairgrounds. Thank you. Uh huh. Skip. Yes. Uh, I guess it would be to Eric on 6L. This is the um, the street widening from. Uh, North Bryant to 122nd to Memorial Road. And I, my question is, is, if as we go forward with these these projects where we are widening the streets, how much uh, would it take as far as uh, time and I guess the 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 revenue to address these issues with a bike lane? I, I understand that the where we're just doing resurfacing like we did on Hefner and, and, and Memorial, that that was a major challenge as it relates to trying to create a bike lane. But if we're already doing widening, is it possible to, to either downsize some of the time to, to see if the revenues would be available to create some bike lane since we're widening the streets anyway? We are finding with the budgets that were developed for the 2007 bond issue that they are very tight as we do just the basic widening projects moving forward. Um, the cost for materials is, is somewhat variable, but we're seeing that they're higher than they were expected in 2007. And so to add the extra width that would be required for a dedicated bike lane, 
would be difficult at this time. Now we are experiencing some bike routes and things in Oklahoma City where we're using sheriffs, where we're encouraging bicyclists on roads and, and marking the roads as such that they have shared lanes where bicyclists share with regular vehicular traffic. I think we're finding some success with that, with signage and some of the paint that's on the pavement. But again, I think it just comes down to a matter of cost. If we're going to look at dedicated bike lanes, um, we're talking about extra width of pavement, extra cost, and especially as you look at that from mile to mile, it gets quite expensive quickly. So I think it's more of a budget constraint than anything else. Well, <clears throat> it's worth us to, to visit that issue, I think, as we go forward. Because it, it, it just makes it a much safer engagement for, for traffic and for the cyclist. If, if we're out doing the, the infrastructure to widen, I just think that we ought to be mindful of, of some of the concerns that, that the drivers have in cars and also the, the safety of those individuals who are out you know, uh, cycling. Well, let us work together, public works and planning. Planning helps designate the bicycle routes for Oklahoma City. Let us work with planning to, to see what more we can do with, with our available resources. Thank you. I, it seems like a few years ago we kind of examined where we wanted long-distance bike routes to be in the northeast part of Oklahoma City. Because we have a number of riders in Edmond who end up on Oklahoma City streets. And we didn't want to build bike lanes on every street, but we wanted to, to figure out where the, the best way and work with the biking community. And I assume we're working still along that, that process? We are, and there are, act there are active projects that are continuing to do bike routes throughout Oklahoma City. You're going to see new signage as we proceed forward. And of course, it's being distributed by ward across all of the city. Um, but again, it's not a lot of dedicated bike paths on existing roads. It's a lot of sharrows. It's the use of trails. It's the use of a lot of our existing infrastructure to make that happen. Yeah, we would prefer they went to trails, but the biking community, there are those that really want to be out on the streets for, for, for their long distance training. And so we, you know, it's kind of fallen upon our shoulders to figure out exactly how we can get them safely you know, in, in a lot of those rural areas of the northeast part of the city. It's not, an e it's not easy, um, but I, I know we're working on it. Welcome. Any other comments on the consent docket? Yeah, Ed. I just want to ask about P. I think I understand what's happening with this 150000 This This would take our total expenditures, I guess, to about $1.1 million, which if I'm doing the math right, would be about 80% of the Mary Gardens budget. Our goal is to get down to 33% by 2014-2015. Can, can somebody walk me through, how's our strategy to shave 600000 off over the next couple of years. Well, Brian's here to answer that, and Pat Ryan does sit on the budget committee with the, with the Mary Gardens Foundation, and, and David also. I can tell you that um, this is the, the step, the, 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 the final step of moving all the employees from being city employees to become uh, uh, foundation employees. Uh, they have already submitted their budget for fiscal year 13 and 14 to us. It's gone to the committee, which Councilman uh, Greenwell and Councilman Ryan are on. Um, they're moving the, the subsidy actually is going from 36% to 44% next year, um, where, there, where our, our portion is being reduced. Um, let's see, right here. Uh, the, the key thing is, is there's a reduction of about $200,000 going into next year in overall expenses for the gardens, and there's additional $300,000 of increased revenues that they're anticipating bringing in. So at the end of the day, for, as we go into next fiscal year, uh, the, the next fiscal year is the key fiscal year, 15, 14, fiscal year 14-15 is when we're trying to get where the city subsidies at 33%. Um, in this case, um, next year it's around 44, 56%. So, we're getting closer to that, and uh, we're working towards that. So it's 68 this year. It goes down into the 40s yes. next year, and then 33 the year after that's, that. That's the goal, to get it to 33 in the next fiscal year. And the strategy is that you're going to have about 300000 more in revenue. Yes. In addition to, OK. How, how, what, where does the increase, hundreds of thousands of dollars of increased revenue come from? Um, again, it's. Uh, fees for utilizing various services there. Um, and there's also a, a, there's the uh, funding that they get from for just membership fees. 
they're trying to sell more membership fees. And then, it's, again, it's just more user fees. Brent, I'd be happy to give you more detail. Well, and they're uh, anticipating larger amounts of contributions from the uh, private sector being made, in addition to increased earned revenue by the uh, foundation and, and membership. So that's their goals. And there's a lot of activities out there where they charge for, for instance, renting the restaurant. Uh, they have a lot of private parties in there where they bring a caterer in for that. Uh, they have weddings in the garden. And it's amazing how many private enterprises take place in the garden. And all those things are rental type uh, opportunities for the administration here. And they anticipate that will continue to grow as it becomes more known to the public. Well, I think they've, they've, they've put a pretty realistic, optimistically realistic budget together. And I'm, I'm uh, confident they're willing to try hard to make it. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions on the consent docket? We have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Just two items on the concurrence docket today. Comments or questions on the two items? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8 is items that require a separate vote. Item 8A has already been deferred until April 2nd. Item 8B is a couple of drainage easements in Ward 3. Larry, you okay with these? Yes. All right, you want to make a motion then on the first one, item 8B1? I move for approval. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. And then, Larry, item 8B2. I move for approval. Cast your votes. And it passed unanimously. Item 8C closes an access easement. This is in Ward 1, Gary. Yeah, I don't have a problem with this, and it passed through. Uh, anybody here to speak on this? I move approval. All right, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes on 8C. It passed unanimously. Item 8D is an item that's being introduced today. Jane Abraham is here to kind of explain this item. This is a public hearing. We have one person that has signed up to speak. Jane, you want to go ahead and explain the item? Good morning, Mayor and Council. Jane Abraham with the City Manager's Office. And I'm just here to describe briefly the um, reason for the ordinance change that is proposed today and being um, is on for introduction. Um, several years ago, the United Way brought together um, the first um, senior summit, which brought in senior citizens to talk about their needs and their issues for the uh, nonprofit community and for the governmental entities and other um, organizations to try to understand better their needs. What do um, seniors see as challenges um, that they're facing that are not met? One of the major issues that came out of that was transportation, that seniors get to a certain point where they feel like they shouldn't be driving anymore or can't drive and don't have reliable um, transportation. So there, um, this built up kind of over several years. The uh, medical community also had an interest in this issue as doctors felt that their patients had better outcomes when they made, uh, when they kept their medical appointments. And so transportation was starting to be an issue in that um, regard as well. The, um, so this is just, and I guess I just kind of talked about all of those um, issues. A working group was pulled together to um, analyze the issue and see if there were, if there was a way for these needs to be met um, in the current nonprofit infrastructure, and also to analyze um, an organization called uh, Independent Transportation Network, or ITN, and the um, Oklahoma County Medical Society really took ownership of this issue and has um, kind of started this as a nonprofit uh, for the central Oklahoma community. And this is, ITN America was started um, by a woman who's uh, Catherine Freund, whose son was um, severely injured in a car accident with a senior driver. And so that motivated her to look at this issue and try to find a solution for, for people once they get to the point where they shouldn't really no longer be driving or for um, children of, of parents that um, they, when they get to the point where they need to take the keys away from their um, elderly parents and to be able to provide an option for them. So the program is uh, not government funded. It's a nonprofit organization set up as a 501c3. And it is currently the Oklahoma County uh, Medical Society 
is housing the nonprofit organization uh, as they continue to ramp up. So the issue before you today is that the city's vehicle for hire ordinance provides several exemptions for different categories of vehicles, but it does not have an explicit nonprofit exemption currently. And ITN is not a taxi service, but it's also not free. It's a membership service where the riders um, sign up to participate in the program, the volunteers sign up to participate in the program, um, and so the exemption is similar to what other ITN affiliates throughout the nation have, um, have done in order to accommodate the service. Um, I think I went backwards. Okay, and that's essentially all the information that I have. Um, there's representatives from ITN Central Oklahoma if you would like additional information um, about the organization, we can provide that. All right, I think Dr. Mark Mellon is here. Doctor, would you like to come forward and give us some opinions on this? And uh, We will need your name and address for the record, please. Okay. Um, Mark Mello, you need to tell me 416 Northwest 17th in Oklahoma City. Uh, as Ms. Alexander said, um, I think this is a uh, major nationwide need for transportation for seniors and probably uh, even more acutely needed in this community, which is such a very large geographic area without a well-developed uh, transportation system. And actually, uh, County Medical got involved in this. We were hearing a talk from one of the professors of geriatrics at uh, OU Health Science Center, and she was talking about uh, both the medical and psychological um, uh, areas that were very hard for physicians to deal with the patients because when you take away the keys of somebody in this city, you're basically confining them to their home for the most part. Uh, and so. We found out about this organization and uh, uh, after probably a year or so of uh, talking with several of the community service uh, uh, leaders uh, decided that this would be the project that we would want to uh, uh, sponsor as the current uh, County Medical Society's uh, community service uh, fairs event. Uh, as, as I'm sure you know, the most recent one was the uh, Health Alliance of the Uninsured and County Medical also birthed the uh, Hospice of Oklahoma County. So we feel this is a very important service. Um, the uh, way it works, I don't know how much time you have on this, but the way it works is that volunteer drivers um, use their private vehicles to transport patients, uh, transport uh, seniors. Uh, there's encouragement to really make this a social interaction that the uh, uh, passenger sits in the front seat so they can chat about things on, on their way. Uh, there is no restriction as to the uh, service site, so somebody might go for a medical visit, but could go to the mall, could go to really whatever they want. Uh, they become members at a nominal fee, $40 a year, and then put money into an account so that no money has changed hands in the vehicle at all. And so it's purely a, uh, a volunteer effort. Now the volunteers, however, can also um, get something later in return. They can bank hours that they have uh, used to drive people to use for their own uh, benefit if it comes to time that they need somebody to drive. So basically most in, in the communities where this has been established nationwide, and there's over 20 of them now, um, the uh, most common driver's age would be newly retired. These folks drive people around and then uh, at a later date can uh, use it uh, for themselves or they can donate these hours to uh, family or friends. And there's also a, a mechanism whereby uh, indigent uh, passengers can also ride. Uh, part of the way that we uh, raise money would be once you get to the break-even point, anything above that can be put into what's called a road scholarship fund, and uh, that is then given to uh, indigent passengers who might, might need services. And of course, both uh, private citizens or the uh, volunteers who drive can donate their uh, mileage hours to indigent. So I think Really, it's a way to provide uh, transportation for elderly in the city and to not have the city really need to come up with funds to do something that's necessary uh, uh, in the city. All right. Doctor, thank you. Any comments or questions on this side? Good question, Your Honor. Yeah, uh, Pat. On the uh, a volunteer, would there be a requirement for the volunteer to have additional insurance beyond what's required? Typically? No. No, the volunteer would go through uh, background checks, both criminal and, and safe driving checks, but since they are not paid, 
uh, they would not require extra insurance. Okay, good. thank you. Mm -hmm. Ed? Can I, I just want to clarify that last sentence that you just said about that this would replace the need for the city to come up with funds to do. But I, I'm certainly, I, I think this is wonderful. Uh, I think that I, I definitely agree that in terms of health care and public health outcomes, you've got to get people to their appointments. Um, Sooner Ride has, has provided a similar service. My understanding, though, is that about one out of five senior citizens over 65 would not be able to drive. Um, so that's tens and tens of thousands of people within the Oklahoma City area. It, as wonderful as this project would be, it's never going to reach the level to replace public transportation investments that the city would need to make. I, I just want to clarify. Oh, no, that, no that, that's absolutely true. I mean, I think you could try to diminish it. And also, of course, we're trying to develop senior activity centers, and perhaps this would be another way to get people uh, to and from these, uh, these facilities. But no, I'm sure that there'll still need to be some additional help. Okay. Okay. Mayor, if I could, um, I've had an opportunity to visit with Dr. Mello and with Catherine earlier about this project, and I want to really compliment you both for the tenacity with which you've stuck with it. I think it's a terrific alternative for the community and really does fill in a gap um, in a place where seniors driving is getting more difficult. And so um, I'm very supportive of the idea and really appreciate the collaboration that you've put together with the various groups to help provide the seed dollars to get it started. So thank you, thank you Mark. Mm -hmm. Doctor. Doctor. Yes. Uh, are you familiar with the uh, Metropolitan Daily Day uh, Center in Northeast Oklahoma City? No, sir. And I want to tell you that, you know, whatever we can do for our aging population, I, I think we should do more and, and, and look for better ways to, to better uh, uh, serve the quality of life for those individuals. Uh, recently, I had a, a visit with uh, Miss Jackie Parks, who's the director of, of the Metropolitan uh, Day Living Center. And this issue has been a, a major concern for them for quite some time because they do go and pick up, uh, you know, uh, individuals who, who have challenge issues and needs and family has to, to tend to other business during the day as far as work. And they provide a, a safe place for them to have uh, activities during the day and, and, and provide the transportation. I find this, you know, a, a great idea. Unfortunately, several years ago, they came to the city through our social, social services program, and they were denied funding for the very issue that we're talking about here today, and that is to provide transportation for those individuals. That was what they were wanting was to a grant that would give them you know, funding to help with their transportation as they go throughout Oklahoma City and bring individuals to, to, uh, to Northeast 37th Street and, and take them back in the evening time. Or sometimes the family comes, picks them up in the evening. But uh, I, I just think that these are uh, projects that, that we do have in existence in some parts of the city that does a great job in reference to serving those individuals who, who have gotten to that that point in life where they cannot take care of themselves as far as driving. And, you know, I, you know as far as the, the, the volunteer aspect of it, you know, one of the things that I have a question about is how do you secure the insurance for the safety, if anything was to happen, for those individuals who are being transported? Is there, you know, when you send all these individuals will be volunteers, then if there was a car accident, you know, where's the liability for, for those individuals who have been transported? So that's my paramount concern mm -hmm. as it relates to those that are the, the, the citizens, the, the people who are being transported. You know, well, uh, this uh, network has been established in, I think, 22 cities throughout the country so far. Um, any kind of negligence by a driver would be an issue whether it's a driver for this service or for anything else. But the actual, there's no special need for uh, liability insurance for the volunteer because the volunteer is a volunteer. And so the volunteer could have you in a passenger seat or me in a passenger seat for any purpose and they wouldn't require extra insurance for that. 
So that has not historically in the other cities that this has been developed uh, been an issue. So I think, for, and, and as far as is there liability from ITN Central Oklahoma, uh, there would be if we weren't appropriately screening the drivers. So the drivers, as I mentioned, go through background checks for criminal records as well as safe driving records. And so these would be people just like you and me driving somebody in the car. And again, this item will be set for a public hearing on March 12th. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 8E is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. Is there anyone here wishing to speak on any of the three items listed under 8E, dilapidated structures? All right. How about a motion? Second. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 8F is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Is there anyone here wishing to speak under any other listed under 8F? All right, cast your votes, and it passed unanimously. Item 8G is a public hearing regarding a budget amendment, and Doug Dowler is here to give us more details. Doug? Good morning, Mayor and Council. I'm Doug Dowler from the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, the budget amendment before you today uh, increases the city's budget by about $13.5 million, and I'll just try to run through real quickly some of the changes that we're making there. Uh, the Capital Improvement Projects Fund is being increased by $2.6 million to accommodate the distributed antenna system that was an agreement that was approved last week uh, by Council. And this just is a place where we're consolidating funds from several different places and need the budget authority to spend it in the CIP fund. Uh, we're also increasing our contingency. We've spent it on several projects, or we've spent it down uh, on several projects already this year. And so we're trying to just build that up just in, in case as we come towards the end of the fiscal year to make sure we've got budget authority in case something comes up there. In the fire sales tax fund, uh, we've got uh, some fund balance being used to uh, accommodate uh, fire station number 26. This is a geo bond project that's costing more than was originally anticipated in the geo bonds. And so we're using 750,000 of the fire sales tax to make up part of that or to make up that difference. And then also $150,000 for personal protective equipment. Uh, that's costing more than was anticipated, uh, partly because of a, an additional recruit class as well as a chemical incident that happened earlier in the year. Uh, the hotel motel tax is being increased by about $1.5 million. Again, this is related to the revenue bonds that were uh, approved earlier in the year to fund the outdoor arena there. Uh, this is just to make sure we can, uh, again, have the budget authority to use that hotel motel tax for that purpose. Uh, in the internal service funds, our risk management fund, uh, we've got some additional needs there for personnel costs because of retirement and uh, wanting to make sure we have an uh, equitable or a smooth transition uh, into, uh, in, that, in that position. Uh, in the special purpose fund, this is one of the places where we accept donations or, or contributions. Uh, and in this case, we've got uh, one from the OU Health Science Center to, pay for, to help pay for some drainage improvements and then also for a, uh, where, where a developer had paid uh, for sidewalk improvements. And this is to, uh, again, be able to use that funding there. Uh, in the stormwater drainage utility fund, uh, replacing the hydraulic cylinders on all three of the low water dams on the uh, 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 Oklahoma River is about $550,000, again, using fund balance. And then finally, the, the, the largest changes at our water and wastewater utility fund. Uh, with the drought, they've had to uh, pump a lot of water from uh, southeast Oklahoma, so electricity expenses have been higher than expected. Also, the lower lake levels that we've uh, had have resulted in the need for a lot more chemical treatment to remove the extra uh, dirt and dust uh, out of the water. And so uh, between those two, it's about $6.3 million that we're adding into the uh, Oklahoma City Water Utilities Fund. So uh, again, it's about $13.5 million. It brings our budget to about $979 million. And the utilities is offset be, uh, due to additional uh, correct sale, yes. sale of water. Yes, no, that's correct. Any comments or questions for Doug? Just a quick comment. Uh, Doug made a comment, I think, uh, if I heard him correctly, that we were increasing the hotel and motel tax. The tax level is staying the same. It's the amount of money that we're going to increase. That's correct. And, and in all likelihood, we may come back for another budget amendment because one of the requirements from the bond issue is that we transfer all of the money over there to help cover our debt service, and then whatever is not needed comes back to us. Hotel motel tax has been doing better than expected. 
we may need to increase that budget authority just so we have the authority to send all of the funds uh, to them again later in the year. But we're, we're monitoring that situation. I just so want to be sure the people out there that we didn't increase anybody's taxes. Nor can we. Only the voters can, uh, can change the rate That's of, good, of, of I, the motel tax. It, it, as, as I thought his comments indicated there was an increase. Yeah. Your Honor. Yes, David. Just a quick question, Doug. I think you said we're now, this revised budget will put us at $979 million. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate us going beyond a billion next year? I mean, we haven't put all the numbers together. I'm not sure we're going to be there this year. We're going to be getting pretty close to that, though. That's a lot of money. Thank you. Really, seven, 970 is a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments or questions for Doug? Doug, thank you. Well, let's vote on item 8G. Do we have a motion on this? Oh, we're going to need a motion. And a second. Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. Item 8H1 is a right-of-way permit to hold the Run Lucky 5K in Ward 2. Ed, you okay with this? Yes. All right. Anybody here representing this event today? Would you like to come forward and tell us about your event? Good morning. I will need your name and address for the record. Good morning. Uh, Don Garrett, DG Productions, 14420 South Meridian, Oklahoma City. Rick Ayling, uh, 833 Northwest 41st Street. And tell us about the Run Lucky 5K. This, this is our third year uh, raising money for the Leukemia Lymph Lymphoma Society. And uh, we have about 2,500 participants each year. Start off with 1,500 the first year, and we're up to hopefully 3,000 this year. So uh, it um, uh, starts on the classing curve, or up there at the Chesapeake, ends in the classing curve uh, shopping center there. All right. Well, thanks very much. We appreciate it. Good luck. Thank you very much. All right. Oh, before you go, is there a website where people can get more information if they'd like to participate? Certainly. We have a, we have a, a, a web page uh, that's uh, runlucky dot com and also uh, we have a Facebook page that, uh, that people can sign up online or, or they can sign up uh, in person uh, Saturday and Sunday all, right. all the way up till an hour before the race. We'll encourage people to get out and help. Thank, Thank you, you all. Much. How about a motion on this, Ed? Cast your votes on 8H1, passed unanimously. Item 8H2 is an event that will be held in Ward 6 called H and 8th Night Market. Meg? Yes, uh, Mayor. Uh, Laura Massonet was, oh, is back, I was going to say, had to leave. But Laura, if you want to just tell us a little bit about the additions to this year's mar night markets. Thank you. Um, we're very thrilled to be coming back with the h and night market for 2013. We have seven months, the last Friday of each month, planned. Um, we're asking you to let us block both lanes of traffic this year. Um, that will give us more room for the trucks, make it a safer event as kids pass onto the federal campus to play on what looks like a park <laughs> and don't get hit by cars that are coming behind the trucks. So we want to expand it just a little bit. Um, we have a sponsorship this year that's going to allow us to put in a stage, a little bit of lighting, um, paid musicians. So it's getting a little bit bigger, but still keeping the community feel. We're getting a lot of help from our neighbors at Ludovine and at Scissor Tail Salon this year. So building a community on that block at Hudson between 7th and 8th. Well, I did want to also this. mention that it's been fantastic to work with Joshua, Joshua Ryan uh, this season getting ready for this event. It's been very helpful. And I think just for those watching, um, 7th Street and 8th Street will both be open. That's correct. So you know, yes. we've kind of contained this. You've expanded the width of the um, facility by adding both lanes of traffic, but 7th and 8th will be open. So we yes, that's correct. have too much of that area blocked off. It's a great event. Thank you, Lord, Thank very you. much. Thank you. Meg, you want to make a motion? Yes, I'd make a motion that we approve. All right, comments or questions on item 8H2? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Thank you. Item 8I is for the issuance of the debt for the parking garage. Rakane is here, and, and uh, the contract for the new parking garage was awarded uh, last Friday at Compton. Councilman Greenwald was there for that. and. Uh, we're moving forward on it. And Brooke's got a little bit of an update for us on the garage. Well, as you know, um, that we continue to experience pressure on providing more parking in the central business, the downtown central business district. 
Um, last Friday, the trustees of the Central Oklahoma Transportation Parking Authority approved this same resolution that's before you this morning, which basically sets out the parameters on our bond sale. Um, the slide that uh, is in front of you, this picture, um, is a architect's rendering of what this garage will look like. Um, you're looking at it as if you're in City Hall looking south. Uh, there's going to be 10 levels of parking. We'll have approximately 830 spaces in the parking garage. There'll be entrances and exits on both the Main Street side and the Cold Court side. Um, the elevators will be on the northeast and northwest corners of the garage, so they'll be facing City Hall. You might uh, know that there was some interest from the Urban Renewal Authority to potentially do some development on top of this garage, whether it was housing or potential for office. Um, so in response to that, uh, we did design this structure with the capability that in the future, should any development occur, it could be built on top of the garage and we'd have this structural foundation in place to sustain that construction. Um, we've also designed it so that there is a, a walking passageway from the north to the south. So if you're heading to 420 or vice versa, coming from 420 to City Hall, uh, there will be a safe pedestrian passage in the garage. The second slide uh, has the same uh, situation in that you're looking south towards the garage structure. I think consistent with the downtown design guidelines and to try and reinforce that there's pedestrian act, uh, activity at street level. Um, we have approximately 20,000 square feet of what would be considered retail or commercial space on the first floor of the garage. Um, the trustees were very concerned about making sure that this has a real quality look to it and so we have a lot of glass and granite finish on the frontage of the retail area. We anticipate it's probably going to take about 12 months for the contractor to finish this project. We hope to get started at the end of this month, the first part of April, and be done then in late, uh, late March, early April in 2014. It's a great project. Rick, I have, I have a question about, and I've, I'm, this may have been asked and answered before, but if that's so, you have to forgive me, but what's the impact of this parking garage on the one that we already have it on just a half a block west and a block south? At Sheridan Walker Garage? We're actually, um, we'll be um, moving some people over from that garage, primarily the library folks, or, or we're going to move a little bit closer to the library. We do anticipate that the Sheridan Walker Garage is going to be the parking garage to support the downtown elementary school that will be built just immediately south across from it. Um, I would say that the biggest impact of this garage is going to be to try to relieve some pressure off the Santa Fe Garage. We've got a number of parkers in the Santa Fe Garage that work in Leadership Square, Oklahoma Tower, and we're working with those building owners to, in the future to relocate some of those parkers to this garage so that we can again take pressure off on that east side garage because there is a lot of uh, demand over there and there's still vacant office space over there that if they backfill that space will put even more pressure on the Santa Fe garage. So Sheridan Walker is full now? Sheridan Walker is, it has a high occupancy. I would not call it full because we do oversell our garages and we're not there right now. Um, but it's it's going, to be, it's going to be tight. I mean, overall, our occupancy in our garage system is 111 percent. So we are selling more monthly parkers than we have spaces in our garage. That's kind of the condition downtown right now. So we really would like to take pressure off of several garages, but we're still going to have a high occupancy in the Sheraton Walker garage, even with this garage being built. We're very optimistic the cash flow on this garage will be. I'm not saying it's going to be black from day one, but it's going to be, we think it's going to be in, in the black very early. Your Honor. Yes, David. Uh, Rick pointed out that the bottom section is has a granite uh, exterior. But Rick, last week they pointed out that that's actually less expensive than some of the other uh, finishes they were looking at. That Just is correct. That give is people correct. the indication we're not going, we're not out of control with our expenditures <laughs> with respect to this. So. Yeah. Rick, thanks very much. But, but, one more, one more question. Okay. Hold on. As the uh, have you done any, uh, has, has any of the first floor been leased yet for indication? Yeah, we'll be, we'll be working with the Alliance on that, um, and they're helping us because that's not our expertise in the parking side is to, is to do that leasing. And so um, that we are, we have had conversations with different groups about the possibility, but 
at this point in time, we've not signed anybody up, that's for sure. Mr. Mr. Ryan, we've, uh, we'd, like to, we'd love to see private folks come in, into that first floor. Uh, if that's not possible, I have indicated that the city would be willing to take a look at that for possibly, you know, if we were to do a clinic, maybe that might be a future location of a clinic. Uh, maybe it could be uh, we could move some of our development center folks over there instead of having to go up to the 8th floor of the 420 building. That might be a more customer-friendly area to be for, for that. So we haven't committed to that, but that may be a, a long-term good use for some, a few city operations also. Look at commercial operations. A year is a pretty short time to make the plans, having yes. built out property. So, understand. Okay. You, you, you'll include wordage in the bond, which would make it possible or not preclude to separate transportation and parking if, in the future. If at some point we decide we want to do that. Yes, that's actually in the trust indenture, um, and our and the copy board will be actually. Um, looking at that later part of this month to do that so that the option will be there to do that uh, to have both separate parking and separate the transit functions and now is the time that we need to do that when we don't have any debt and the, and the trustees have the authority to make that change so basically every bond that's issued from here on out will include that language yes because it'll be in our trust indenture okay thanks all right any other comments or questions for Rick Thanks, Rick. Thank you. All right, we need to uh, make a motion then on eight I. Yeah. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item eight J. I understand we do need executive session. Yes. All right. Cast your votes. Item eight J moves to executive session. Item eight K, L, and M. I understand we do not need executive session. So how about some motions on that? Who wants to make a motion on eight K? All right, cast your votes on 8K, passed unanimously. Item 8L, looks like we're good to go there. How about a motion? Move it. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 8M, uh, no need for further discussion we can strike today. That. We can strike. Okay, cast your votes on striking item 8M, and that item is struck. Item 8N, though, I understand we do need executive session. Yes, sir. All right, how about a motion then to move item 8N into executive session? Move. Cast your votes, and that moves on. Item 8O is claims recommended for denial. We have one person that has signed up to speak. Dalton Beebe. Good morning, Dalton. Hi, how are you doing? We'll, we'll need your name and address for the record. My name is Dalton Beebe, and I live at 7401 Southwest 105th. Okay, and which item are you here to speak on? Uh, the denial of my claim. Yeah, but which claim is it? I'm saying it's uh, it's D. 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 Yeah. Okay. And uh, before I get started, uh, this paper said that the claim was for seventeen thousand dollars, but that was what the estimate for what the repairs to the truck would have cost, and so that was a mistake. What my claim really was was sixty-five hundred dollars, and uh, I would like to can I present these pictures. Uh, bring them on now. What is the name on this claim? Uh, item 8OD. I, I, Dalton, can you explain why the name Sherry Reeves is on our list here? Yes, uh, she. Uh, that's my stepmother, and she uh, right. she co-signed for the truck, and uh, I paid her for the vehicle. I paid it off. Okay. Hey, my name just never got changed. I see. We'll need your name and address for the record as well. Sherry Reeves, 7401 Southwest 105th Street. Thanks very much. And okay. Yeah, I co-signed for the truck, but he made all the payments and everything. All right. Dalton, what can you tell us about, about what happened here? Yeah. Well, I was, um, I, I understand that they uh, deny, asked y'all to deny my claim with uh, the defense of approximate cause, saying that the uh, uneven roadway was not the cause of the accident, but it was rather the actions of the driver, which was myself. Well, um, what the city uh, staff has failed to realize is that it was, uh, the approximate cause was, uh, was the crevice, and it did happen in a natural and continuous sequence. As soon as my tire hit the crevice, 
it instantly blew out and forced me to lose control of the vehicle. The events that occurred after my tire went into the crevice are, are irrelevant because the crevice made me lose absolutely full control of the vehicle. Um, the pictures that I've given you clearly show that the crevice was part of the roadway. The road is completely falling off where the white line should have been. Um, and if this crevice were not there, then this accident would have never occurred. Okay. And where, where were you driving? Uh, in, on the 8100 block of uh, Southeastern, which was right in between 240 and 89th Street. And um, we're passing the pictures along, okay. so I'm just kind of um, allowing each of the council members to see it. And so uh, it sounds like your 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 tire, it, it, according to what you're trying to tell me that the, the road was, was not paved appropriately, there was yes, some, some sort of indiscretion in the road, your tire hit it, the tire blew out, that caused the car to be involved in an accident, and you're bringing a claim against the city for our um, inability to provide a proper yes, roadway. Sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Just want to make sure that okay. we have kind of the details um, uh, while the council continues to look at the picture. Why don't we bring up our, our city staff and um, see what information they can provide the council. And Good morning, Amy Harrison, Municipal Counselor's Office. Um, Sherry Reeves' claim form, also Mr. Beebe's claim form, state the same thing that um, a driver heading southbound on Southeastern had entered his lane of traffic as he headed northbound, causing him to have to veer off. Um, so um, that was the, uh, the cause of the accident, was okay. him entering we're not disputing that. No. Okay. And that, the, is, is there state law that, that guides us on this, on, on what municipalities can do when, when a situation like this occurs? Well, we don't have a duty to have a shoulder on the roadway. Um, and there was construction in the area. There was also, in the pictures you can see, warning signs that um, there's an edge there on the roadway. Okay. That, those, uh, or may I speak? Sure. Uh, those roadway pictures were occurred two weeks after they're not um, they're, they're, there was no construction on the roadway at the time that's what the roadway in those pictures looked like at the time of the accident construction didn't begin for over two weeks after the accident occurred and I, I think what she's saying is that is, is this state law that, that does not require us to have the shoulder here correct is there discretion that the council can use, or does state law restrict the council's ability to pay the claim? I would say that only if you find that the condition of the roadway is such that the city was negligent in its maintenance. But is, is there precedent on this? Have we paid claims similar to this before? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. How often do we get claims like this? Not really very often, and typically this situation is that the, the driver for some reason went off roadway, which is not a covered portion of the roadway that the city is responsible for maintaining. Right. Yeah, really here it's uh, based on his claim, a car came into his, his lane and that's what caused him to veer off. So if you, if you find that the condition of the roadway was defective at that point and that that's what caused the accident, you can, you can pay the claim. I mean, it's really up to counsel. It's a question of fact, whether or not you think there was a defect in the roadway that is what caused the accident, as opposed to it being caused by the other <coughs> car coming, crossing the center line, which is what caused him to have to veer off the road. Okay. And Dalton, you said something about that the amount was incorrect. What? Yes, uh, but, uh, I hadn't, when I veered over, I didn't veer too much to the right. I mean, it, as soon as I veered off, it just ran down, blew my tire out, and I mean, the rest, you know, I, I mean, it was over from there as soon as, and um, you asked about the, the amount. Uh-huh. Yeah, the, the, what the $17,324 was for was what it would cost to fix the vehicle. That wasn't what the claim was actually four. I see. Is there, do you have any insurance on the vehicle? Yeah, uh, I had liability insurance. Okay. All right. Always David, question. and then Skip. Uh -huh. Dalton, two questions. Uh, one, 
were you able to identify the vehicle that was approaching you and, and forced you uh, to swerve a little bit? Like, um, do you mean, did I see it coming? No, no, no. Uh, I mean, after the accident occurred, do you no, know? They, they'd never stopped. Okay. And the second question is, did this result in the vehicle turning over a yes, rollover? Sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. What's, what model vehicle is this? It's a 2001 Chev Chevrolet Silverado uh, extended cab. Did the car roll? Did, did it roll? Yes, sir. And, but it rolled because you blew a tire, is that right? No, I, I went, I went into a ditch and the ditch was, it was kind of at an up angle and when I hit it, it just sent me through a barbed wire fence and uh, the truck rolled. Uh, I just had no control over it. I mean, I don't, and you know, I, I lost all control of the truck and the, the bar ditch was, you know, it was at an upward angle, and so when my truck hit it, it sent my truck into the air. When I landed on my tire, you know, it just kind of just rolled it. I mean, it happened like like that, you know. But the city didn't create the bar ditch. Is that, is that right? I don't know about the creation of the bar ditch. Um, but, but just considering but for the other driver entering his lane of traffic, would the roadway have caused this collision anyway, basically? Well, is there any factual information that there was another vehicle that interfered with his lane of traffic or his driving? Was there a... Yes, his claim form. Yeah, it's stated in his claim. Was there a, does the police identify the other vehicle? The police report it varies from his claim form and the, the version that he's giving us today. The, the, Police report says something different than what the claimant says in his verified claim form. So we're going by what the claimant said in his verified claim form, that a car veered into his lane, and that's what caused him to go off the road. Well, can, can you succinctly so tell us what the police, the police report The police, police officer never asked me what happened at the scene of the crime, or at the wreck, the scene of the wreck. Uh, and, I mean, he... What, what he said, you know, I mean, there's, you know, he never asked me my, what happened, and... Right, the, the police report says that Dalton veered across the center line and lost control of his car when he was coming back and then went off the road. That's what the police right. report says, as opposed to another car coming in toward that, Dalton. That, that's all true, that, but it started when they came into my lane and I veered over, my tire got stuck, and then it spun my car out into the, over on the oncoming traffic, and I tried pulling it back, and that's when you know, I okay. didn't have control over it. Yeah, I, I can see how that could happen, David. Well, I can certainly too. Uh, once that wheel gets off the road, you've lost control, depending upon the conditions of the uh, shoulder. I've been in a situation like that. It's been many years ago, but. Uh, and the road condition does look suspect, at least. Uh, the white line on the side is, is eroded. The uh, asphalt has been, has deteriorated. To me, it looks like the condition of the road is at least partially responsible for the accident. That's just my... You know, what is the, the amount that you're requesting today? Uh, so the, what, I, what I paid for the vehicle, which was $6,500. And I have the title with me. Well, I'll look for some direction from counsel then on a okay. motion to, uh, to, to you pay. Why, why is that amount different than what's in here? Did I miss that part? Are you not the seventeen thousand dollars? Yeah, that there was a mistake. The, the I sent an estimate in on what the total would be if they were to fix my vehicle, and it was seventeen thousand dollars to fix the the truck, and uh, it was like two hundred thirty nine percent totaled, and uh, I never, I've never, I never asked for seventeen thousand dollars. So he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be entitled any more than no. the value of the truck. No. You know? So he's reduced it to the value of the truck. Uh, how about, the, have you reduced it based on whatever salvage you, you have? Um, I have. It's sitting at uh, the wrecker. I know. Uh, and 
the salvage place told me they'd give me 500 bucks for it. And, uh, well, it, it seems to me that an accurate claim would be the, uh, the value of it, not what you paid for it, but the value of it, less what you can get for salvage. I, mean, so, so I think uh, you ought, we ought to – this is in my ward. This happened on South uh, Eastern, which is my ward. And that street is, is an atrocity, and it's really bad. You can tell by the – or it was. You can tell by the depth of that bottle. I mean, the, there's that deep a, 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 a fall off from the street to the bottom of that uh, – I, I'd like to see you bring this back and look and work your claim a little bit, work it over a little bit with regard to the value, because it's not the it's not what you paid for it, and it, it's not what it cost to fix it. It's what it was worth the day it happened, less whatever value you uh, they'll give you for it. So, I would move to continue this for a couple of weeks and give you an opportunity to to, revise, to think about what I've said and revise your claim accordingly, and then let's talk about it. Thank you. I'll second you, that. Yeah, yeah, Dalton, if, if you determine the blue book value of it, the value of what the car would have been at that time, and submit that to us, less a salvage value, we'll just put it on for approval. Okay. Thank All you. Right. All right, Dalton, we're glad you weren't hurt. Yeah, thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks for coming down. Anybody else here on a claim recommended for denial? All right, cast your votes. Well, we need to vote on moving that one to two weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about a motion on that first? It'd probably be easier just to strike it, and we'll bring it back to you. Okay. How about a motion then to strike item eight o d? All right. Cast your votes. Eight o one d is struck. Now, how about a motion on the rest of the claims recommended for denial? Cast your votes, and the rest of those items are denied. Item 9 is claims recommended for approval. Is there anyone here wishing to speak on the item listed? All right, cast your votes. That item is approved. Item 10 is items from council. Pat, you want to get us started today? A comment. Um, uh, Saturday night I went to the Philharmonic at the presentation at the uh, Civic Center, and I was cornered by several patrons there during the intermission about the uh, sidewalk condition around there. Do we have any feel at all when that's going to be completed? It's uh, within weeks, like two weeks. I, I think by the middle of March was the last date I was given on that. Okay, so if it's very I go to the presentation on the 22nd, it'll be all finished. What's that? When I go to the presentation on the 22nd of March, it'll be all finished. I would think the side, the, we're working in, the, in, in many zones now. We're working on cold cord going to the west. It's about halfway down, down cold cord, then they'll come around and continue around on couch. Uh, will this building be completed about the same time then? Probably not. Probably. There's still going to be a, there's still going to be a few, a few, a few. They're coming around and then they'll hit this area and then they'll go further to the west on uh, to the north on Walker. Thank you. Uh, you know, I had one other comment, and that is we had approved several items here that piggybacked on state contracts to acquire things, and uh, I would hope that we are vigilant in making sure that that's still a good deal. I don't know how long those state contracts are for, but prices change. And sometimes the state is a good negotiator, sometimes they're less than a good negotiator. So I, would, I hope that we continue to review that practice to make sure we're getting the best. That's all, all right. thank you. Uh-huh, Skip? Yes, Mayor. Uh, this past weekend I was happy to, to hear the news that uh, Northeast Oklahoma City will be the, uh, the home of a new Embassy Suite hotel. And I was concerned as it relates to the, uh, the reporting of that, that it referred to as the downtown expansion of, of a hotel. And I just wanted to make sure that Northeast Oklahoma City hasn't been included in the downtown district, but this hotel will be at 8th and, and Lincoln. Is that right? The hotel will be located at Northeast 8th and Phillips. Phillips, right. And is, is the, the reporting that I received, is it correct that it is a $25 million hotel, fully engaged Embassy Suite Hotel? Yes, it's a full service Embassy Suites Hotel. It'll be about a $25 million construction project, um, 194 rooms, about 10,000 square feet of meeting space. 
a full-service restaurant and a cafe. So it'll be a great addition to Northeast Oklahoma City. We're really excited about it. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you for the, uh, the work that you've put into that project. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Meg? Uh, just a couple things. It sure is nice to be back home. Uh, if anybody would like to be, think a little bit about um, how blessed we are to live in this community, take a trip to places like India uh, and Nepal, and you will come home a changed person. It, it uh, was an amazing experience, and I'm really happy to be back on this horseshoe with my colleagues. Um, I also made a note, uh, looking in the Journal of Council Proceedings, I'd like to welcome Ann Zachritz to the HP Commission. Uh, Ward 6 has had a gap for a little while, and uh, Ann is going to do a great job representing Vesta Park and Ward 6 on HP. So thank you to all that helped make that work. All right. David? Oh, go ahead, Skip. Mayor, can I backtrack just for a second? Uh -huh. I, I would be remiss if I didn't do this. Uh, this past weekend, we, we lost a, a very, very great steward for projects for the city of Oklahoma City and also for, for one of our, our, our major hospitals in the city of Oklahoma City, Ms. Zora Brown, who, uh, who has served uh, on the, the Wellness Committee. And, uh, you know, she's, she's had a battle, and uh, she finally um, had a homecoming uh, this past weekend. And so, she has been a representative for Ward 7 as far as the MAPS projects um, and, and a very, very strong person as it relates to wellness and concerns of, of, uh, of wellness and fighting the issue of cancer. Um, and so um, we, we lose a very, very you know, great individual who always had her heart and her mind committed to the projects that she served on. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. David? Uh, Pat, I just want to let you know they are making progress over there on Couch Drive. Uh, and I appreciate you bringing that up last week because ever since then they've been working on the sidewalks. And, and uh, in fact, they knocked out our sewer and water last Friday, so we were temporarily without that. But it's progress. and. Thank you for your comments. No, it's, we'll put up with that. It's, it's getting better. Thank you. All right. Pete? Uh, a couple things. One, um, I think I, I, I'd like to remind everybody that today's Election Day in Oklahoma City, and you need to get out and vote. You know, the way elections are done in Oklahoma City, they, elections are put on days when nobody knows it's an election. So every vote is much more important than it would be under normal circumstances. I just would urge everybody to get out and cast your vote. Yeah, elections in Ward 1 and Ward 7. Ward 1 and Ward 7. And, uh, and there are some other elections around the community, I think, too, that are, t that are on today. But uh, uh, just something we ought to do, vote. The, uh, the other thing is I wanted, again, to, uh, to remind everyone uh, of the governor's initiative uh, concerning uh, uh, trying to put the smoking matter on the ballot. Uh, it probably won't be on the ballot until the fall of 2014, but uh, right now you can register your um, approval of that idea uh, through contacting the website, which is www.dontsmokeonme.com. You can register on that website if, if you uh, like the idea of a, of a statewide ballot on, uh, on controlling uh, the, the use of combustible tobacco. And you'll get on a mailing list, and you'll be when the when the petition drive actually begins. I'm sure they'll contact you to try to get you to sign it at that point. But again, I want to compliment the governor for all the work she's doing, trying to get, make sure this matter gets a fair hearing. Okay. Councilman McAtee, happy birthday is is in order. Is is it today your birthday? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Thank birthday. you, Your Honor. You're uh, I'd like to mention a couple of things this morning. First off. Uh, OCCC, Oklahoma uh, City Community College, uh, was the uh, site for last weekend's Wednesday through Saturday uh, NAIA National Swim Championship, where young collegians came from virtually excuse me, all over the country to compete. Uh, Oklahoma Baptist University won the championship. They were the host school. And uh, Dr. Jerry Stewart and uh, Steve Blumberg did an excellent job of coordinating the venue and making that a successful venture. So uh, my hat's off to them and congratulations to OBU. 
Uh, the second item, uh, Sunday afternoon, all afternoon, and then again uh, yesterday morning, a group met uh, comprised of uh, representatives from, a, from, from a, the uh, engineering company that's doing the work on Northwest 23rd Street Revitalization Phase 1, Atkins Engineering, uh, along with uh, representatives from uh, planning, Kim Cooper Hart among them, uh, and then from Public Works, Ed DeGraff and Reed, and then Kay Buzzle joined us yesterday morning, along with a group of citizens, uh, Jeff Schilling, Don Hummer, Jeff Grove, Fred Henderson, and Kim Lowe, and uh, very actively engaged in the design of some of the uh, landscaping features for the project, and uh, some drawings came out of that were very, very excellently received, and I had the opportunity to share them with the Musgrave Pennington folks last night, and they were very enthusiastic. There's going to be a public meeting scheduled on April the 2nd, the site's still to be determined, where citizens in the Windsor area will be able to see the branding of this uh, corridor called the Windsor District and what the streetscape will entail. And the first construction should start at right around July 1 or during the month of July. And that construction will go from uh, Ann Arbor on the west to uh, Tulsa on the east. So we're very excited about that. Uh, and then lastly, uh, under uh, President Hen uh, Acting President uh, Henry Deweese and the Musgrave Pennington uh, folks had a neighborhood meeting last night. I thank them for their hospitality, for my wife and I, and wish them success as they continue to move forward. They're very active in trying to uh, resuscitate uh, their uh, neighborhood patrol, which had been a, a model in years past. And uh, Sergeant Epperly from our police department was there to encourage them. And so we're looking for some uh, Good days ahead for Musgrave Pennington. Thank you, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. Ed? Uh, I also want to just thank everyone who came out to the um, public transit town hall meeting last Tuesday. There were some 500 people in attendance. I thought I was just very proud of the city and very proud of everyone, uh, very grateful for their attendance. One of the things we talked about was um, the possibility of a Title VI challenge to our current transit strategy. And I wanted to ask Kenny for some clarification um, based on, on discussion that's come up. I, I attended a Rail Evolution meeting late last year. I asked a panel some questions, which included the Salt Lake City Mayor. Some of those individuals indicated the possibility that our strategy might invite Title VI challenges. I asked Kenny Jordan to research the question and, and uh, come up with a paper, right, which you completed in the last month. Um, which I would request be released to the public. Um, we also had uh, a speaker, uh, an internationally recognized transit planner, Jarrett Walker, who told a workshop of, of some of us and, and some 35 people that he thought there was risk of Title VI challenge. So independent people without a dog in the fight are, are multiple people are saying there is the risk of Title VI challenge based on our, uh, on our strategy. Um, the first thing is uh, put out in, in social media after the meeting, Jeff Bezdek wrote, the, municip the municipal councilor advised the subcommittee in our meeting yesterday that their formal assessment is that Title VI is not an issue here locally. I'm not a lawyer, so I can only go by what I'm told. It, just so I can clarify, when, when somebody says the municipal councilor, they can only be talking about you. No. Okay. I wasn't at the meeting. I didn't right. talk to Jeff Bezdek. Uh, it was uh, Amanda Carpenter talked to him after the meeting. It wasn't during the meeting, and it had to do with the previous memo that we had prepared a draft of for you, which dealt with the, the specific issue of if the streetcar system is built and then money was taken from existing funds were taken from the bus system to fund O&M of the streetcar system, could, could a Title VI uh, challenge to that be filed? And the answer, of course, is yes. You could have a Title VI complaint. And whether or not there would actually, actually be liability, we'd have to look at the specific facts once the complaint was filed. So that's what this memo that you were speaking of was about. And that's what Amanda was trying to describe to you, Mr. Bezdek. And no, I did not say that Title VI was, could not possibly be a problem. And this, this is an issue. Well, first to clarify, we're, we're potentially talking about a council that involves none of us. Currently in Portland, you're having 
this, you're having budgetary constraints. They're cutting the bus system some 20 to 25 percent to help maintain streetcar maintenance. And all the people that were on the council when the Portland streetcar came online are gone. So 10 years from now, all of us, or certainly the, the large majority, we're talking about city manager, mayor, council, municipal councilor. I mean, it could be completely different personnel. So it's not us that we're talking about. It's future policymakers. True, but uh, there's nothing you can do to actually control the actions of future policymakers. You know, say the council completely changes and they actually did that, then potentially you could get a complaint under Title VI and just have to litigate that at the, at the uh, Federal Transit Authority. Have we ever looked at this issue? Have we looked at, at the legal implications of the strategy before now? Uh, which strategy? Or specifically? Are you well, well, when we were deciding what went on the MAPS-3 ballot, did we look at the legal implications of, of uh, placing the, the $120 million on the streetcar and not putting in any investment in the current transit system? No. But we internally had some discussions about the potential of, of Title VI, but felt that if there were new dollars set aside, not existing dollars, as you've referred to. I've never thought that we would take dollars out of transit and put it into the dollars to run the modern streetcar. That was never, at least my vision, although that was never a policy decision or discussion made by council. But if we were to take existing dollars and move it toward the streetcar system, I think we could be at risk. But that's never been my thought process anyway. That would have to be obviously approved by council in future budgets. But if new dollars, new general fund dollars were put into the operation of the streetcar, I believe that the risk is minor. So just, just to clarify, during the MAPS-3 process, we had internal discussions about Title VI implications. Oh, I don't know if it was during the MAPS-3. I think it's been subsequent to that, but not I mean, before recently. Right. So the, fi the fixed guideway study, its conclusion that was is that enhanced bus service has the backbone to the system plan and is the number one priority for Oklahoma City. Um, as recently as September... 14th, 2009, a newspaper article says, as we're trying to, to decide whether those transit improvements will include better bus service, light rail, a modern streetcar, or some combination of the three, will be among the details city officials release at a news conference within two weeks. So as late as very late September 2009, I mean, it, it seems like there's movement as to which part of the fixed guideway study we put into MAPS-3. This what I'm asking is, as we're, during those deliberations, is Title VI being considered? I don't believe so, Councilman. Okay. I believe it was after that. Okay. Um, here's my concern, Kenny. I just want to read, because I've heard, and this, this was put out this week also on OKC Talk. This mirrors the argument that I've heard of streetcar subcommittee members make. This mirrors what I've heard advocates that basically the bus system is hopelessly dysfunctional. We need to put money into a streetcar where uh, affluent uh, the higher income uh, individuals will buy into it and then you get passage of a regional transit authority and a dedicated funding source and then a rising tide lifts all transit ships and then some 10 years from now you get improvements in the bus system. Somebody writes, Dr. Shadid seems to be ignoring some fundamentals of political science. The older and wel wealthier an individual is, the more likely they are to vote. To really make public transit happen in Oklahoma City, there has to be a major focus on getting affluent whites to ride a public transit system. The focus has to be on affluent whites because they are the most likely voters and therefore the demographic most important to engaging in the public transportation discussion. If affluent vote white voters buy into the system, then the O&M revenue source will be less of a struggle because the politically influential have buy-in. The attempt to refocus towards buses while laudable would undercut public transit in this city. Large numbers of affluent whites are highly unlikely in the extreme to patronize a bus service no matter how dapper and gussied up. Councilman Sheet, I've never heard that before in my life, that that's been our, our, our thought press. That might be what somebody's putting into a blog, but I've never heard that discussed within city staff or at this horseshoe. I've heard it myself multiple times, and so that's, that's why I bring it up. Um, I, I think it is... Um, um, it, it, I think you, you haven't heard it on this horseshoe. No, 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 no. I haven't heard it on this horseshoe. I haven't heard it... Haven't heard heard it, it no, okay. no. So let's clarify, yeah. Right. But, but in terms of the people 
who are advocates, who uh, lobbied hard during the process. If you look at all the newspaper articles in the three months before MAP3, I mean, that's not, I mean, it's not, even, it's not city staff that's being interviewed. It's community advocates. Um, let me just, let me get back to, to Kenny. When a program, I, I want to clarify what you're, what you're writing in your opinion. When a program receives federal funds, all of the funding recipients, operations, and contractors will be required to comply with Title VI. So if COPTA takes over this, it's not, and even if the streetcar doesn't get federal funds, everything has to still uh, comply with Title VI. If COPTA takes over that, I would say that's probably an accurate statement. Uh, yes. Okay. Now, concerns are not limited just to Title VI, right? Title VI deals with ethnicities. Um, race and religion. And race and religion. And but ethnicity. But agencies must also follow federal policies and their own agency regulations which require them to consider and address the adverse environmental impacts their activities may have on minority and low-income populations. So there's other, other federal guidelines that govern socioeconomic class. It's not just Title VI. I haven't actually looked at the regulations myself. Uh, there's some disparate impact regulations of the Federal Transit Authority, and I don't know whether those address socioeconomic impact or not. Uh, from, from just a general reading I've done, I don't think they do, but I don't know for sure. What do you think would, would happen? My, my listening to all the city's presentations at that meeting, it would, it would appear that every city, or almost every city that's doing this, has a partnership with developers. Developers are always in place first. Portland, the developers and the people who did the streetcar are the same people. Um, Seattle, it's Amazon and Microsoft. I mean, the developers are always on board first. And there seems to be a partnership that, uh, it seems like all of the ones that I, I've read have some business improvement district or special assessment district or developers whose land values are increasing are contributing to O&M. What happens if three years after the vote, not only do we not have a business improvement district or special assessment district, we haven't even had the conversation. We haven't even asked developers who's willing to contribute, who's not. And so if we don't have those kind of partnerships and then you divert money, from your current transit, does that make you, does that potentially have higher liability? That's, it's really kind of purely speculative and hypothetical, but I, I would think if you divert your current funding from the bus system to put it with the, to the streetcar system, then I think at any time you could potentially have a complaint filed on that. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure whether that would make the possibility of liability any greater your the situation you were describing but I mean if you take money out of the bus system to fund O&M for the streetcar I think that could be a problem and I, I think essentially that's what this memo says is that you could have a complaint filed on that and then you'd have to determine the liability based upon the specific facts you were dealing with at the time. One thing that we might want to admit another opinion is, is it possible that you could get a Title VI challenge even without the diversion of funds, even based on having such wildly disparate uh, methods of, of treating transit riders, even if you just execute the current strategy where you have, um, um, you have the lowest ridership in the country, you have the lowest financing, you have the lowest funding of your current transit, you have no evening service, you have no Sunday service, you have limited Saturday service. If you run the streetcars all day long, including the evening, so you've got a discrepancy there. If you have, we're talking about, during the fixed Godway, we talked about eight to 12 minute frequencies. So the streetcar comes by every eight to 12 minutes. You wouldn't want to do it any slower than that because you could walk that, that distance in that amount of time. So it comes by every eight to 12 minutes while your buses are coming by every 60 minutes. You have shelters, presumably downtown, nice shelters for your, for your streetcar riders, and you have everybody else out in the wind and the sun and the rain and the snow. So is it possible that just basically executing this strategy, even if you didn't divert funds, that you could have a Title VI challenge? You can always have a complaint filed, uh, yes. Now whether or not there would be actual liability or not, 
I can't really express an opinion on that. You, but certainly someone could file a complaint. I read a paper over the weekend uh, that was put out by the FTA where there were uh, eight complaints filed during the period from 2000 to 2007. And of those eight, seven of them found no violation. And the one, the other one was settled by a mediation. That was the Atlanta case that you were, are familiar with. So it's, you just have to look at the specific facts relative to each complaint if it's filed. But Los Angeles, I mean, they got to do their transit planning in court for 10 years. But this is not Atlanta or LA that have robust bus systems. This is some of the worst conditions for transit riders in a bus system in America. And, and that, that's a different situation than Atlanta and Los Angeles. And the, the discrepancy between the two is going, to be, is going to be very stark. It's going to be more stark, I think, than Atlanta and LA. Um, is, it, is, it, is it significant that there's no consultant there's no consultant who came up with this strategy. There's no consultant that said, if you want to improve your transit system, put all $120 million into the streetcar, ignore the, the recommendations of the fixed guideway study, which said that you're enhancing your bus service is the number one priority for Oklahoma City. It's not necessarily significant that you didn't have a consultant in advance, but uh, I mean, just that, just the fact that you didn't have a consultant is not going to make you liable. It's going to be what the facts are at the time the complaint is filed. So you could get a consultant at any time if you wanted to, or... But would it increase the, the possibility that somebody might interpret that you're making transit decisions not based on necessarily how to best improve your transit system, but on political considerations on how to get a vote passed or how to... Not necessarily. The, uh, like what you read, that's just one opinion of one person. And as you know, everybody can state their opinion these days on the internet. So, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be liable or not liable. I, I, think, I think one question to ask is, is the rationale for the strategy. We, what, what we put out there is the streetcar would be the connector for a commuter rail system. People would come in from other communities, and then they could get off the, the, the hub and get on the streetcar and be dispersed through downtown. W what happens if you don't pass the Regional Transit Authority, the dedicated funding source, you don't have commuter rail coming into Oklahoma City? Then what happens to the rationale for the streetcar? Then what happens to the rationale for an intermodal hub? Do you need an intermodal hub if all you have is a streetcar and you never have regional transit, never have commuter rail? Do you need a... Uh, I mean, these, I think, are questions that we need to start to address as a policy-making body, uh, in addition to finding out a diversified funding source for O&M that goes beyond just, we're going to take it out of uh, the general fund. All the, the questions you were raising there would actually be for a, a transit consultant, uh, someone you know, say that Rick would hire, that, that's actually an operational transit consultant. The, uh, and the truth of the matter is, if the, if the streetcar were not built, then you could take the money for the streetcar and spend it on any city capital improvement. You could spend it on a replacement of the police fleet, or you could spend it on uh, road improvements. It can be for any capital improvement. It would not necessarily be for the bus system. Tulsa and Oklahoma City are the only two, of course, according to Nelson Nygaard, Tulsa and Oklahoma City are the only two cities with more than 500,000 people that don't have a dedicated funding source. And I think that's the, that is the bigger issue, is how do we get a dedicated funding source for transit? That's how we solve all these issues. Instead of, of, of trying to take on projects uh, and then fund them out of the, the highly volatile uh, general fund. Gary? City manager reports. In your packet is the uh, February sales tax collection report. Um, it's one of the largest checks we've ever received, but it is slightly below target. We had, I guess, our expectations pretty high for February. February does reflect a lot of the Christmas sales on that. Uh, that being said, it was still 0.2% over last year, and we're still at a rate, a rate of over 6% uh, 
uh, year to date over last year. So it's still pretty strong. Uh, and we've got to remember that uh, in January 1st, all of us took a 2% uh, decrease in spendable income. You, you, that is correct, sir. And so that may have impacted us. Yeah, this is really for late December, early January. Whether that affected came into this check yet, it, 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 it's, uh, it would be hard to say that, Mr. Ryan, but you, you, you do bring up a good point that, that there is less uh, disposable income because of mm -hmm. But overall, our numbers are still relatively strong. Yeah, and um, uh, despite my being attributed with a negative attitude, I hope this good trend continues. Yeah, 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 I'm looking at that. You know, our 0.2 percent growth year to year doesn't sound as robust as what we've had before. But Tulsa was down three full percentage points. Norman was down also 0.2, like we were. Edmonds' growth of only three percent is much lower than what they've seen. So there, something was going on in the entire state. Well, the state was uh, actually down over, overall. We were we were up yeah. a little bit. So yeah, it would make, I mean, Midwest City and Moore seem to be kind of outliers in that in that, but. It wasn't just us. I guess that's what I'm, that's my my point of bringing no, we're, that we're up. We're probably the leading growth in the state. The, uh, well, the, the, the metro is yeah, certainly yeah. driving the, the, the state's economy. That's true. Uh, I wanted to mention. I'm, I'm glad uh, uh, Skip brought up uh, Nora, Zora Brown's passing. Uh, her funeral service will be this Saturday. Uh, and Zora had been serving on the wellness um, committee for uh, for Maps Three, and we will miss her. Uh, also, I, I spent Saturday at the uh, OCCC uh, swim meet, uh, what Larry mentioned, uh, huge crowds out there, uh, thousands. And then I went over to the fairgrounds and I was amazed at the size of the crowd for the uh, Class B uh, finals that were going on Saturday. The, the girls were playing when I was over there. And I'm guessing there were 5,000 in the stands. And then, you know how they bring the, the individual uh, community backers down low. They were, you know, they were standing room only down there. But to see that many Thousands of people come out to gain. They couldn't possibly have had a, a significant connection to the town. The towns aren't that big to have to that many crowds. And you also you look around that arena and you see the, the the results of the improvements that we've made with the hotel motel tax going into the fairgrounds and, and how it's not just the horse shows. I mean, it's it's events like the the, the high school championships that that benefit from all those dollars. Then I went over to the um, um, uh, the the, um, uh, the antique show and. Crowds were huge there too, so the fairgrounds was just jammed on Saturday. And anecdotally, uh, a few of them did visit either Penn Square Mall or some of the other malls or the outlet malls, so that, that it may, may help us yeah. in the future. Yeah, good, good point. They're, they're spending money when they're in our, in our city. Has anyone signed up on Citizens to Be Heard? No one has signed up. Is there anyone here wishing to speak under Citizens to Be Heard? All right, well, we have executive session. We'll be back.
The council has returned from executive session. I'll look for a motion on item 8J. Okay, cast your votes. That item passes after discussion in executive session. Um, that's it. I guess we can adjourn. We're adjourned. <laughs>